Welcome everybody to the spring 2022 lecture series of the School of Architecture and Design at New York Institute of Technology. I'm Alessandro Melis, uh, the chair of the lectures and event committee and would like to welcome everybody on behalf uh, of the Dean Maria Perbellini. Uh, the topic of our lecture series this year is communities and we intend these as communities beyond borders. We think this last aspect is especially important these days uh, considering the uh, current political situation, this will offer opportunity to discuss and debate how the application of architecture, design, digital arts, and urbanism in this context can achieve a positive impact, how they can contribute positively in a way and innovate and be of benefit to communities and society. Uh, today, particularly thank uh, John Doria, Don Juan Moon, and Gregory Melitonov for having conceived and uh, uh, curated an event. So they are the speakers, but also the curator of this uh, special event, which addresses the theme of community in a very engaging way through three practice-based experiences. I'm very looking forward to hearing uh, more about this. So I would like to start to introduce uh, uh, Vadi, our guests. Uh, John Doria is an architect, construction manager, and architectural educator. Uh, projects of focus for John are those delivered through design build methods. He has experience with residential inst institutional and transportation building project. Uh, John has been, a teaching, uh, has been teaching at New York Tech since uh, 2019 and received his master's in science of construction from Stevens Institute of Technology in Hoboken, New Jersey and Bachelor of Architecture from Pratt Institute in Brooklyn. Uh, Dong Wan Moon is an architect and partner of MM. K Plus, an award-winning architecture and urban design firm based in Seoul and New York. Previously, Moon has, work, has been working uh, with world-class firms such as Forster and Partners and Con Pedersen Fox in New York. He has also been actively involved in public, public interest design in Kenya, working as director of architecture at M3, a nonprofit design organization. He holds a Bachelor of Architecture from Syracuse University and a Master of Architecture in Urban Design from Harvard University Graduate School of Design. And then the third of our guests, Greg, uh, Gregory Melitonov, is a founding partner at Toller Can, a New York and Central America-based design studio. He's the winner of the AIA New York's New Practice Award and the Architectural League Prize. He received his Master's of Architecture from Yale University and has been an adjunct at New York Tech for five years. So uh, let's start with John, uh, John Doria. John, the floor in your, is yours. Hey. And thank you very much for being with us today. All right, good evening, everyone. So this lecture today is going to try and be as interactive as possible, I'm not going to try and be like the typical lecture that's given where each person speaks and then there's questions at the end. What we want to try and do this evening is have the participants, the audience and the students, most importantly, at NYIT participate. And the way that we're going to do that is first by having these questions presented to you in the beginning of our lecture. And then while the lecture is actually proceeding along, feel free to write into the chat bar and I'll try and answer your questions. And then as uh, the other presenters are presenting their work, uh, they can also uh, respond, vice versa. So to start, we wanna ask the questions, how will we live together? What does our world's current global environmental and, height and health crisis mean to you? What is the meaning of community, community to you? What is the meaning of social justice in your community? And what is the meaning of quality of life in your community? So we wanna open the floor and, and have some of our, our students at NYIT or others that are joining, you know, just jump in, unmute yourselves and you know, answer one of the questions so that we could kind of hear what you're thinking so that it can um, create a better conversation tonight. And if we don't have any volunteers, uh, Professor Moon or Melantinov, you know, feel free to jump in. So let's see if we get any bites. You know, and if you if you're going to speak, please introduce your name and if you're a student. 
Hi, John. Uh, this is Alessandro. Uh, just in voice, or you want also because you were saying so the question could be also written in the chat. Did I understand correctly? If they could either respond in chat or they could they could speak and unmute themselves. Okay. Thank you. No volunteer. <laughs> yeah, we're trying something a little different. So if it doesn't work. Well, I, I really like the idea because it's we are talking about community. So let's make a, a, pre, a presentation as a community. That's a great idea, actually. Are there any, any of my students that are on tonight that want to volunteer? Any of my students? <laughs> It could be a simple answer, anything. But... This is Sue. This is Sue. These, the, the, I mean, the first thing I thought of when I saw these list of questions is respect. You can't um, understand social justice or quality of life or community and how we're going to live together unless you are willing to listen and respect people's opinions who differ from yours. That's, that's what I got. Thank you. An aspect, if you allow me, John, also to, to tell my opinion, I'm particularly interested in this topic, as you probably know, this is the, the uh, title community was the main title for the um, our project for the Venice Biennale. What I like of the ter terms about community is that many times as architects, we are focusing so much on, let's say, uh, intellectual structures that uh, over overwhelm some, sometimes the community. I'm talking about cities, architecture, complex neighborhood, but in reality, what is interesting for us is to understand what is uh, the needs of the uh, minimum unit of social cohesion, which I think is the community. Thank you, Alessandro. And somebody, uh, somebody replied to the chat also, uh, adaptation and acceptance, echoing Sue's comment before. So what would, what would you mean by adaptation, uh, V. Viola? Do you wanna? especially in terms of climate change, adaptation is crucial. Yep, exactly. So I think in a lot of the projects we're gonna see from, from today's lecture, you know, we're gonna see like how, how we're thinking about architecting community and how we really have to talk with people. And that's the most important part. So I think um, if no one else has any, any other um, responses, we could, we could move forward. I'm gonna, I'll give five more seconds and then I'll go to the next slide. Keeping in mind, I would say keeping an open mind to change the world from Celine. Okay. All right, so thank you for your responses. I'm gonna to go to the next slide. So I'm gonna start off today by speaking about what it means to be an eyewitness designer. Oh, we have one more from Nupur. Thank you, Nupur. The meaning of community to, to, mean, to, me, to mean when it comes to architecture designing general, I look it as it as a collaboration each day and each step, bring each one to a good level of design and always discuss, right? I think communication is probably critical and we're definitely gonna see that in, in Moon, in Professor Moon and Melantov's work. Great. So, so this is where, oh, we have another one from Nadia. Now they're all coming in. <laughs> Nadia is saying here, I once read something where when it comes to community, the people should be coming together toward a common goal to better each other. Exactly, definitely. Totally agree with that. And this is where I kind of creating this term called uh, an eyewitness designer. And, and that is in some way for us to come to this idea about architecting community. So what does it mean to be an eyewitness designer? An eyewitness designer 
is one who is of this time, right? We're in year 2022. In order to be an eyewitness designer of today, you have to be living in the moment. Uh, it's a modern who responds to our current world, whether it is in terms of crisis or certainty. And in, in, in our world today, there's constantly some sort of crisis and some sort of certainty where we know what to expect from tomorrow. Sometimes we just don't know what's gonna happen the next day. So the eyewitness designer is, is a maker, it's a creator, someone who has firsthand experience or is an observer to a problem. This could include the scientists who developed the COVID-19 vaccine, right? This could be civilians standing up for social rights, or it could be civilians fighting for their homeland like we see overseas, or it could be us being architects providing shelter for migrating people. And recently in the news, we, we saw Shigruban's proposal for housing for people, for Ukraine refugees. So, you know, thinking in the past, who, who could we seen historically that could possibly be called eyewitness designers? Maybe, maybe someone like the Wright brothers with their contributions to flight. Definitely Andy Warhol and pop art, living in the moment, trying to tell us what's going on in our, in our current world and its status. Or maybe those you know, who tried to help others move through the Underground Railroad during slavery, making discoveries in science, trying to push the limits to music with like Mozart symphonies, for example. We're trying to understand and push us into the future like with Nikola Tesla testing out his Tesla coils. Or maybe it's just the iPad. And I, I'm one that could honestly say this, the iPad has probably transformed my life in, in terms of drawing, sharing information, and you know, being able to present my ideas as quick as possible. So all these tools that are helping us to create and, and, and move forward are, are things that are important to us or the modern time we're living in. So if you think of something that has had a profound experience on your life and impact in our culture, that maker could be what's called an eyewitness designer. And that's what I'm trying to describe here. So the eyewitness designer therefore is one who responds to the events of society, politics and economy. So these are always the three things that we're always trying to study, uh, social, uh, political and, and economy, uh, economic items. Perhaps we may see that our youngest eyewitness designers are those like our students studying architecture at NYIT. And what better laboratory than an architecture studio to surface the problems which drive design thinking. So this led me in the fall of 2021, last semester, to explore the same questions that were presented at the beginning of this lecture of how will we live together? What does our world's current global environmental and health crisis mean to you? Meaning of community? What does social justice mean in your community? And um, what does the quality of life mean to you? So we discussed this in, in uh, my, some of my sections last semester. And what we did was we took all the responses and we populated them into a word cloud, which you could do for free on Google. And what we found in the word cloud is that the recurring words from the students, right? So I'm thinking that our students are the eyewitness designers. I wanna kind of put them on the stage and let them share their thoughts. So the words that came up most often were people, life, quality, global, environmental, social, and justice. So these were the words that kept reoccurring. And one response from a student that stood out to me was, the meaning of community to me is being unified. Navigating life is a challenge in itself, and it's something that doesn't have to be done alone. By standing together, we become stronger while providing protection in order to move forward. It's important to know that unity is better than division. After all, we all live on the same planet. And I think that kind of revolves back to this idea about architecting community. We all live together on the same planet. So how do we kind of work with the pieces in, in our context to develop something that everyone can enjoy? So after, after having these discussions, there seemed to be an idea to understand perhaps publicness. In other words, the quality or state of being public or open to the view or notice of people at large or a quality that facilitates or encourages self-organized interpretation of the built environment. 
So here we see the, the high line and there's these picture windows where you could kind of just observe the public moving by people, you know, getting to work, drinking coffee or, or, water, or cars passing. So following up with these discussions, I wonder if an interdisciplinary design studio composed of urban design, interior design, and architecture students at perhaps NYIT could investigate further what publicness means to them in today's world and how it may generate a way of architecting community. And to help us understand what publicness is, students in, the, in this type of course could look at artists who've experimented with publicness. And those could include Vito Akanchi, Marcel Duchamp, or perhaps Marina Abrimovic. Um, so in a, in a conversation, and slide here is from Vito Akanchi's work in public spaces. In a conversation about his work, Vito Akanchi said, I never leave out public opinion, not public appreciation, but public consideration, public response. And then he says, people are part of all the pieces I do. I anticipate a range of responses or at least actions. And Marcel Duchamp wrote, all in all, the creative act is not performed by the artist alone. The spectator brings the work in contact with the external world by deciphering and interpreting its inner qualifications and thus adds his contribution or her contribution to the creative act. And Marina Abramovic, a uh, performance artist, described in her exhi ex exhibition at MoMA in 2010, it was a complete surprise, the enormous need of humans to actually have contact, contact. So understanding publicness definitely requires us to understand people first. Me personally, I cannot see how it would be possible to architect community without first understanding the people who need to use it. And now interestingly, what we can see on the, on the posts across the internet is the metaverse is becoming something that's popular. Firms like Big and Zaha Hadid Architects are designing virtual spaces for people to meet up on the internet. For those of you that don't know what the metaverse is, it's a virtual environment where you use VR, virtual reality goggles, to interact with people over the internet. So how does something like the metaverse actually affect our understanding of publicness and the way in which we architect community? Can our student eyewitness designers in an interdisciplinary studio also investigate what it means to design for a virtual environment and people that, are, that become a bunch of ones and zeros? So as eyewitness designers, what are we, how are we gonna you know, interact with what's coming within technology and you know, moving into a virtual environment or working in crisis and certainty? How, how are we gonna resolve these issues? And, use our emotions, our experiences to make the spaces, uh, make spaces possible. So on the projects that we'll see from Professor Moon and Professor Melitinov, we will see how they explored ways of architecting community. The skills of work from both of them are either urban or rural. So it will give us a great lens to compare and contrast how their physical work interacts with the context or site that they have um, situated. So I'm gonna pass it along to Professor Moon. And while Moon is presenting, if anyone has any comments or questions, feel free to drop it in the chat bar. Hey guys, can you guys see my screen? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Great. Thanks. Thank you, John. Uh, yeah. So I'm gonna start my part. Uh, I guess it's an ongoing uh, conversation here. The title "Architecting Community" um, represents uh, the way how architecture and design can deliver a sustainable and comprehensive impact on our communities. So last uh, seven, eight years, I have been actively involved with the international NGOs, uh, 
based in Kenya and New York, and I completed numerous community projects in rural uh, Africa. So these are some of the, the projects I've completed. I've done some houses, schools, public spaces, community maps, and etc. But the challenge of these type of project, or I can call it community architecture, is that it usually becomes a one-time event of uh, sort of academic research or an NGO's um, you know, will, or sometimes NGO's end report uh, to donors rather than being a continuous and sustainable project. So, so what I'm trying to highlight here is that architects and designers working with these communities should not only focus on the end results or their aesthetics, but rather on strategies and design frameworks for communities to grow and sustain themselves. So at the end of the day, they're not a result-oriented community architecture, but rather I call it architecting community uh, which infers process-oriented design. So these are some of the photos um, uh, of the process of uh, these placemaking. So again, community architecture, I'm trying to explain it, uh, reverse of it, architecting a community. So with this in mind, um, I'm going to share three architecting actions working with different communities in rural Kenya. So this is a location uh, of Kenya. It's the central, well, central east, eastern uh, African continent. These are the three communities that I have been uh, working with. Uh, they are underserved communities with uh, social uh, economic challenges. The first uh, community, or I call it architecting action uh, that I wanna talk about is with the, this community called uh, Majengo. Uh, we did the soil house prototype project with them. This is a location of the community. It's a coastal region, uh, half an hour drive from uh, the main city called Mutuapa. And the, the community is actually um, uh, you know, the square uh, uh, red, as you can see at the top. So this is a, the community plot map uh, given by the local government. So what happened was uh, the government decided to uh, purchase the land and uh, distribute these uh, plots to homeless families um, in the region, right? So each family get one plot, as you can see that red um, color. But having free land doesn't mean uh, they're having uh, proper houses or a place, a good place to live, right? These are, these are the kind of typical conditions. Uh, they usually build their own um, houses and uh, uh, their own built environment. Uh, so we found that there's a set of challenges, obviously. So uh, yes, the government uh, provide the free land, but obviously there are lack. Um, of um, government support, lack of basic infrastructure, uh, electricity, water streets are not there, uh, and thus no sense of community places. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we found out that uh, there's a certain asset, set of assets, um, obviously <laughs> large free land, and uh, many, many people out there, and also local resource, which we call uh, soil. So this is a sort of series of action that we uh, um, uh, established uh, with the community. So utilizing local resources, we share building technology, what we have and what they have, and, and build uh, these house a prototype together with the volunteers and also collaborate with the local artists. And we work together as one to build this uh, sort of uh, experimental prototype house for the uh, this poor family in the region. So this is a kind of the uh, 
the site condition, as you can see, uh, there's enormous amount of soil available, obviously, and uh, many people uh, from the community. So this is kind of the starting point of our project. We utilize the local resources such as I mean, soil and then uh, also the local stones for the foundation. Uh, we became like one team to experiment uh, to different construction method. These are the, some of the soil bricks uh, that we built together. Uh, some uh, local artists uh, work for, for the doors and windows. Uh, obviously there are no electricity or machines. So everyone has to kind of uh, work together uh, to raise these uh, roof uh, structure. And this is kind of the, the process um, the drawings uh, collected um, together with the community. And that's the kind of the finished uh, house. And these are the, some of the moments uh, of the house prototype project uh, built together with the community. Uh, this project, this early project was not really about this, uh, <laughs> the result of um, uh, 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 the project, but rather it actually gave, gave uh, this community sense of hope, right? So the community can do something, uh, you know, with the local resources and with the ownership of the land, right? So that was the kind of the impact that we brought through this uh, prototype house project. The second project that uh, I wanted to talk about is another soil house project uh, with the community called LLI. And this community is located a little bit inner uh, side of the country, uh, two hours from, uh, three hours from uh, Nairobi driving, the capital city of Kenya. So this is a kind of the surrounding landscape or the site conditions, as you can see. Uh, it's a grand land and quite dry. And these are the type of uh, tribe community that we were actually uh, working with. And this is a typical housing condition. Uh, they usually build their nomadic tribe. So they usually build this temporal uh, house, uh, housing conditions. And actually I stay here for uh, one night uh, to know and to get to know what, what the really, uh, the the house is really about and the lifestyle is, right? And interestingly enough, uh, these tribe communities uh, start to build the houses <laughs> one you see on the right, right? Uh, the government finally decided to um, sort of encourage these tribes to build their own um, sort of community uh, so inhabitants. And these are the type of house they wanna build and uh, live. So I think there's a huge gap between uh, their um, traditional or uh, sort of um, cultural house um, and at this modern looking uh, cement uh, block house, right? So in, in order for us to be a, a, a um, community here, Felix has a question. He wants to know, mm -hmm. um, how, how long did it take to build the structure and was there significant construction experience in the community? So the, the project that I'm gonna share is uh, the, the house prototype. Um, it took uh, two weeks to build. And the, the first project that I'll show was, uh, it took uh, two and a half weeks to build. And then uh, they didn't have a sort of enough uh, significant construction uh, skills or um, technology, but um, we do we did had a masons and some local skilled workers. So we kind of collaborated together uh, to come up with the with the solution of the house prototype. I hope that answered the question. Okay, I'm gonna move on. So, so the challenge of this community uh, was. Uh, definitely unhealthy, unstable house conditions. And uh, interestingly that their new houses uh, has no sense of identity or cultural identity, if you wanna call it, uh, but they do have an asset, which is grand land with soil again, and uh, the people, right? They're strong, they're artistic, smart. So we were trying to mitigate these challenges and really optimize the assets that they have. 
So these are the series of uh, processes uh, that we actually uh, develop with the community. Uh, we decide to recycle local resources such as um, uh, poly bags and soil. And uh, we, this time we use earth bag technology. Uh, we share that with the community and a community participated. We learned together and built together and it has a great impact to the community. So this is myself uh, talking to uh, one of the community leader. Um, these are a set of drawings that we uh, draw together and, uh, and this is the sort of axonometric uh, of the plan of this house. So the local resource material that we are actually um, looking at was this uh, bags, right? The bags that usually you hold sugars or rice or uh, harvested kind of um, uh, uh, agricultural materials, right? So we actually recycle these bags and put a soil in it and start to create a blocks. Just like you're making a river dikes or um, some sort of protection, uh, usually, but we instead use that to create uh, earth bags, uh, blocks uh, to build a house. So these are the, some of the photos, how community actually uh, involve and engage and help to build the house together. So this is a kind of the, uh, the sort of final or finished version of it, uh, complete with the also soil and sand finish uh, and uh, cover with the iron sheet at the top. But the, again, here, uh, this project is not really about the result, right? It's not about, I mean, our house is not handsome or uh, attracting, but it's very affordable. It took only uh, less than two weeks to build, right? And it's all done by local material and local people, right? So these are some of the uh, night views. Um, and the impact was quite powerful. After we left the community, they start to build their own community facilities using the same technology that we shared. So this is uh, uh, the, one of the or 12 community members trying to build their own uh, you know, cages for uh, roasters and other community facilities, uh, utilizing different uh, shapes uh, and, and patterns. So I thought that was quite powerful. And this became really uh, sort of popular techniques for them to build their own um, community uh, facilities from that point. Uh, the third project that I want to share um, is called Maya Community Project. Uh, this is a project that I uh, am actually currently also working. Uh, I've been working last uh, three, four years with this community. But the location of the community is again, uh, back to a co uh, coastal region uh, of Kenya. And this is actually the location of uh, Maya community. It's really close to uh, the main city called Kilifi town where the local government, all the uh, infra is located. Uh, but interesting enough, uh, in order to get to the main town, it takes more than two and a half hours uh, driving on an unpaved road. So it's really difficult to get to the town. And it's also really difficult for the government and other uh, people to come into this island. So it's quite remote, uh, quite remote and isolated, if you want to call it. The size is about 100 acre. Uh, the population is about 500 people. And these are the, some of the photos. It's quite beautiful, untouched and pure. But the living condition is not so great, obviously. The housing conditions are not stable, uh, lack of infrastructure, and so on. So again, there's a set of challenges, um, and, uh, lack of basic infrastructure, and there's also like land grabbing practice, which means illegal ownership issues uh, from outsiders, um, and unhealthy uh, school environment. So there are no like educational facilities, uh, but there is an asset, a set of assets, which is um, proximity to water, uh, people with positive mind and beautiful nature and local resources. So again, we wanted to really mitigate these challenges and uh, try to optimize the assets uh, that they have. So these are the series of actions um, we did with the community. So we decided to create a map uh, that could empower the community and strengthen their ownership. Um, so these are the, some of the photos of our um, uh, meetings 
small group uh, design uh, discussions. Uh, we did the mapping together to create this map. And these are some of the uh, progress photos. You know, they start to put their information, their house location, community facilities um, that they have and so on. So we actually collect all the information and create these layers uh, of information and we made a community map. And every two years, we try to update this map uh, with the new information. So this became kind of navigating tool for the community and also uh, the tool for the community to talk about the future, um, you know, potential uh, developments and so on. Uh, we also decided to uh, finish or complete the school that they had. They had a kind of shelter kind of slash school uh, by that time, and they wanted to really have a, a right place for kids to uh, provide education. And we also did a series of design shreds so that community can also design their own ideas and share it. So these are some of the presentation <laughs> by them. And we collected all the information and ideas. Uh, and finally, we decided to um, do this uh, set of proposal, adding teacher's office in the middle, finish the floor, complete the window frames, and stabilize the roof structure. So these are the sort of um, the, the process of how we actually built this school together. So this, this is a ladies uh, trying to um, uh, collect local materials, local stones to the site and the gentlemen start to uh, ram the uh, floor uh, with, the, with the stone. And we also work with a local carpenter uh, to complete our window frames and young students and teenagers also join us to complete the school together. And that was the previous condition of the school. And this was the, uh, the result of it. Uh, but then all the collaboration and design work is actually uh, done by the community and local volunteers. Uh, we also wanted to create some gathering space in outside the school, because this is how usually the community hang out, sit, talk, meet. So we really wanted to utilize this, utilize this space to be um, some nice gathering uh, agora or meeting space. So what we did is we also collected the local materials. In this case, we used the Earthback uh, technology that we have been using for the other community that I was showing um, and uh, complete this gathering space for everyone. So that was a current condition. And this is the kind of proposal after a series of design charrettes with the community. And um, again, ladies bring uh, or uh, deliver local materials to the site and we all build uh, these blocks together, learn together, teach um, each other and so on. Young students, small kids, uh, it's not really construction site looking, it's actually a festival every time we try to uh, work together. So these are some other photos. And that was a previous photo. And that's the new gathering space for, for the community and also the students uh, who um, goes to school uh, right next to it. So these are some of the final photo. It has become the one of the most favorite spot or popular area that uh, kids and the community people uh, wants to come and uh, meet. And lastly, we also did um, this small kitchen project, if you want to call it. Uh, what we did is uh, we found out that all the kitchen cooking environment of this community was quite unhealthy. So uh, we kind of uh, tested uh, the local soil to create a stove uh, through uh, earth. So this is what we proposed. We create this formwork and utilizing the local soil and ram it and create this earth stove. And this is the formwork and this is the result. And that's the, uh, the, the other photo is showing how, how to cook uh, through that. So 
So, I mean, I, I wish I, I have a more time to talk about more of these projects, um, but since uh, we want to you know, bring uh, or start the conversation with you guys, maybe I'll, I'll wrap it up from this point. Uh, and I hope these three examples or uh, three architecting actions, I call it, uh, provided you uh, some kind of idea what we mean by architecting community. Uh, whether it is in rural Africa or urban context in uh, South America, or your, maybe in your own environment in New York City or New Jersey or Connecticut, uh, where you live, um, you know, we architects, designers should, can, uh, play a key role as a creator, uh, facilitators, or bridge maker between uh, the communities and their social, economic, political resources. So rather than focusing on building like community architecture result, uh, we should really be focusing on uh, architecting communities to create their own uh, built environment that is equitable, inclusive, sustainable and beautiful. Uh, I'm gonna end with this quote uh, by Jane Jacobs. Um, she says cities, but I'm gonna just rephrase to communities. So communities have the capability of providing something for everybody only because and only when they are created by everybody. Thanks for listening. And maybe uh, John or yep. Greg. You mm, there are it. there are a couple of questions if you want to if you want to answer some from this from the uh, audience. Yep. One question was: Does the community still have the skills to do self repairs on the the structures that you work on them with? Is that okay, so the question is, do they have a skills to repair things like more uh, to sustain it? Is it what is that the question probably? I think so. Yeah, yeah. Yes, uh, so they do, and they do have uh, skilled workers and um, masons. So when we collaborate this work together with them, uh, we actually taught them how to do. And it's not like one time event, just like I said, we always go there every year and see how it is. So there's a sort of um, continuous monitoring process, uh, even nowadays. I mean, the COVID definitely made us to uh, restrict or limit the travels, but um, yes, uh, they are able to do things. And uh, my hope is that, um, you know, hopefully things get a little bit more open so that we can uh, go there off and there and uh, do these projects even uh, more comprehensively. And I also need a lot of uh, collaborators and students uh, who can work with. So I hope that's kind of answering your question. Is there any other question or we can move on? <laughs> There's a lot of questions actually coming in in the chat bar. Maybe a couple more questions and then we can go to Rex and then we can come back to the questions maybe. What do you think, John? Um, Sounds good. Um, St. Linden is asking for the future, do you have plans in creating more community projects? And if so, what would you like to change about the process? Mm -hmm. Yes, I have a plans and I actually, I'm actually currently working on a couple projects, uh, working with one um, with Maya community and the other one with um, other community in Senegal. So uh, yes, I'm planning to do it. The process wise, I think the, the third project that I did with the Maya community was quite successful because it's really inclusive, right? We have done such a long process of meetings and gathering information, really talking to each other and get to know about the community. The very important thing here is this type of project is um, you have to create a, a trust. 
uh, and, and sense of respect, right? I think Susan mentioned earlier, the respect is the key word uh, to do uh, this kind of project. So you need to really build the trust and the respect with these people who are you, who are, um, who you are dealing with, yeah? Um, so I think the process wise, I'm gonna try to continue this uh, sort of um, the, the, uh, the comprehensive and planning process, uh, what I did for the community. And then maybe perhaps uh, I'm gonna try to find a, a better way to uh, communicate uh, once we leave the community. So I think uh, because it's a remote, right? Um, so that's my next uh, step to find out, um, you know, what is the better process of uh, communicating after uh, we leave the community. So that's kind of a challenge. And if you have some idea, let me know. All right. All right, I think we can, we can move into Gregory's lecture. Sure. Thank you, Moon. Great work. Thanks. Can you see the slide change? Yeah, yep. Okay. Um, thanks, Moon, and thanks, John. Um, and thanks, Alessandra, for the introduction. So um, I kind of want to pick up um, sort of where Moon left off or also just, I think, maybe start to thread a needle a little bit between the two presentations. Um, you know, one of the one of the themes that comes a lot, up a lot in school is about sustainability. And I think um, there's something about how do you create a lasting impact. So I think it's pretty interesting what we've seen already where, um, you know, John's referring to a lot of moments or, or art pieces that really um, strike a chord and maybe temporal in their instance, but have like a very long tail in terms of how we remember them. Um, and then uh, Moon really working very hands-on, um, probably in a, in a spontaneous manner with construction because projects like that are, are often difficult to kind of preconceive. You have to be on the ground and really get a sense of what the what the atmosphere is like and, and what are the, um, as you pointed out, what are the kind of um, the pros and cons, the, the kind of attributes a, a community might bring and the, and the challenges they might have. Um, so uh, my studio, uh, as Alessandro mentioned, is, is based in um, Central America. That's where I, I kind of started, but I myself am not from there. And so our firm, Taller Ken, is a, kind of a mashup of both an outsider um, perspective uh, with a kind of um, uh, a locals a locals point of view that that kind of works to create kind of a new um, a new way of approaching problems. Sometimes um, being but being both an outsider and a local uh, gives you kind of a different way to look through the world. So we try to kind of mash up. Um, what it's like to both work with the hand and also have kind of a, an understanding from, from um, kind of a more theoretical viewpoint. So um, I first started working in Guatemala. And when I arrived in Guatemala, um, I was immediately an outsider who was both um, sort of wrestling with my um, preconceived understanding of what uh, a kind of culture has as their um, sort of um, attitude or face that they put out to the world versus things that you you sort of um, naturally are, are kind of um, hit with as a foreigner visiting a, a new community and new culture. Um, things that were really uh, uh, experiential and temporal, um, also sort of a, a legacy of, of modernist architecture that was also overlaid with um, Spanish colonial architecture, as well as a kind of hybrid of um, uh, traditions between a local indigenous culture and also, um, again, overlays of history between um, 
indigenous Mayan cultures, Spanish colonial cultures, and then um, kind of waves of European modernism uh, that had been going on for centuries. And um, sort of this idea of being an eyewitness uh, architect, John, is, is what it's like being um, an outsider when you're entering a different culture and working within the community. Um, and <clears throat> I kind of found myself part of a group of young designers. Um, on the left-hand side is um, a group of uh, young Guatemalan artists who actually made these architectural costumes of these kind of typical building types and danced around the Guggenheim Museum in New York until all the until all the foam core kind of like came away and they were dancing naked because they were really thinking of these um, legacies as being restrictive and kind of keeping their culture within within um, defined lines. Um, and on the right, you see some um, Australian graphic designers who came and were influenced by this uh, sand carpets tradition uh, that I showed in the previous slide and kind of making their own impression. So we kind of um, started our commercial practice in a similar way where we were inspired um, by something that was really very obviously different than the culture that we were coming from. And so when you're working in a local community, um, kind of one of the first instincts is to kind of isolate and exaggerate something that you are not familiar with. Um, because for you, it's new and different and, and what makes this other culture distinct, and you can't help but kind of riff on that. And I think that's something that comes up a lot with like a critical regionalism. It's like, what is what does this culture have? How do we exaggerate it? And therefore it's supposed to be authentic. But I think that's actually a pretty limiting viewpoint. But um, just to explain the project a tiny bit, um, you have uh, kind of these hanging uh, the indigenous garments are very heavily woven um, by hand. And so we kind of riffed on part of the, the drying project uh, process of these fabrics that created like a kind of canopy and made our own kind of loom, so to say, which resulted in the ceiling treatment of this, of this cafe. Um, but the more you kind of inhabit a place, you, you realize that um, you know, even probably even rural Kenya is, is starting to kind of be subsumed by, by globalization. And as we saw in like Moon's presentation, you know, the, the sort of default is to kind of everybody ends up wanting to be like everybody else. So even though the regions are ex extremely distinct, the way that the global construction industry works, things like cinder block, metal metal roofing, cars, roads, asphalt, there starts to just generally become a standardized sense of um, how people want to live or, or generally homogenize towards the way that we live. And this kind of came to our attention um, when we were offered to do kind of this uh, roadside um, commercial project. And we wanted to sort of get, get out in front of this kind of generic garbage context. Again, this is this is in a place that in your mind might be these Mayan temples and wonderful things, but the reality on the ground is it looks like it could in any, any other suburb. So we kind of riffed on that and really wanted to make a true reflection of what we thought the, the culture was, which is essentially a layering of these previous cultural inputs that I mentioned from patterns, tiles, colors, um, uh, sort of nature and um, and a very playful spirit if you if you have lived in the culture. So we we made this um, kind of restaurant and event space, which is a layering of these patterns. And we sort of started as a firm developing this idea that the more color and textural inputs you put into a project, the more opportunity there was for different types of people to come into a project and to find their own um, access point. So a lot of times in architecture, as Alessandra mentioned, we're always kind of designing for like the singular object or the perfect sort of sculpture, but really there's a kind of um, uh, 
advantage to an eclectic design, which allows for many voices, many different types of um, elements ranging from the technical and the structural, like you see in kind of the upper part, which manages some of the, um, the climate effects uh, to the sort of lower part where you get a lot of textures and colors and, and nature and so forth. So <clears throat> um, in order to make these kind of projects, we ended up working a lot with local craftspeople, working uh, with our hands a lot, um, as you guys do in school. And that led us to um, five years ago, create a nonprofit initiative, which would allow students coming from architecture and design schools um, who we felt really didn't have any real training in how to actually do construction um, and work with people. Uh, everyone's very good at using Rhino and software and so forth, but they were really unfamiliar with how to actually work with people who aren't architects, right? We kind of polish and train good line weights and good uh, everything lines up and, and looks nice when you have your portfolio, but you've rarely, uh, were students, and this is globally, um, really just didn't have any uh, um, ability to explain their design to an everyday person. So we um, sort of targeted a, a disused parking lot and invited um, a handful of students with an open call down to Guatemala. And what became pretty clear very quickly is that students also brought like a very preconceived notion of what should be architecture, which should be kind of reflective of the culture that they were in, but also worked with local students who all of a sudden realized that like somebody from, you know, uh, some fancy school in the US and someone from Guatemala were, were actually being trained in very similar logics and so forth. So we worked, um, the students kind of led the design. We used uh, a lot of reclaimed materials and local populations kind of lending a hand, local donor companies pitching in, and we ended up creating a, a fairly um, large structure using all reclaimed material that um, sort of uh, was located at the bottom of a cultural center and green space that was really disused from the rest of the downtown. It was, it was kind of um, mostly because the, the city has kind of become a car-based city. And so they had this wonderful amenity of space and um, landscape in right in the heart of their downtown and wasn't really, it was falling into disrepair and had a lot of issues. So um, this, this uh, parking lot that was previously gated off and wasn't even being used, we created this um, kind of large installation. And again, it was um, a temporary project that was really meant a, to educate students in, in sort of building culture, but B, to kind of break down a log jam, which was uh, in terms of an opportunity, like a, a disused public space. And it's pretty evident to everyone how, how much this wasn't good for anyone, but nobody could really kind of take the initiative. So uh, by making this sort of more artistic um, installation, we were able to kind of um, bring a lot of different people to the table, including uh, the, the sort of people who managed that park ground, security guards, whose mostly job was like keeping people out, uh, local uh, musicians and, and um, have, a, have a lot of different events for a lot of different people and kind of bring everybody together and kind of create something that allowed everybody to find a kind of, um, uh, to take away an impression. And uh, the, the project ended up being used as a Saturday program for kids that someone else um, kind of took over. Uh, so it's kind of interesting. None of the projects I'm gonna show have, have um, that were done through this internship program have any client um, specifically uh, in, in the sense that they're all kind of, um, initi they're self-initiated projects where we're really um, partnering with groups um, as we go, but the starting point is, is architects. So in terms of this idea about architecting community, how can architects actually jumpstart their own work rather than kind of hope that somebody reaches out to them one day to get to exercise the skills that you guys are all learning in school. So um, I'm kind of fast forwarding. Uh, so we've done a few of these projects. This one was done in the, um, during the pandemic, 
but it's a, a platform for a, a community in Tapachula, in, um, in the southernmost part of Mexico, where um, a lot of the migrant caravans from Central America make their way uh, through the city of Tapachula because the border with Mexico is actually relatively small. So the Central American caravans migrate up through Mexico, enter Mexico um, in Tapachula and make their way north. So Tapachula itself has this kind of um, interest in being a sanctuary city, but at the same time, there is some conflict between migrant communities moving through and the local um, population from Tapachula. So the idea of this um, uh, design build project was to make a platform for activities which would then help to have cultural exchange between um, the migrant population and the locals. So the locals could kind of share their um, kind of culture with the migrants so that the migrants can also share. So everybody kind of gets to learn a little bit about each other. So um, the project's uh, sort of pretty straightforward, but a, a sort of double layer of um, playground uh, underneath with this um, flexible platform on top where uh, panels can be removed to make different um, environments and seating and let light down into the playground when it's not being used. And then above is, is a, um, a kind of large free stage for um, performances, which have then kind of not only become sort of popular, um, but then have expanded out as the programming um, opportunities become more obvious. So you can see that there's kind of like a movie night um, and so forth. And, and this is sort of how these projects come together with a, a group of international students working with local people who are essentially volunteers and interested in you know, kind of making something good happen in their community. Um, but all the funds and materials are all crowdfunded, materials are donated at cost. Um, the combined resources of a lot of international students coming to a, you know, a location that doesn't get a lot of tourism or attention generates interest from companies who are willing to kind of pitch in. And with the kind of um, sponsorship from companies and the uh, enthusiasm from students, you're then able to kind of push through projects through um, municipal governments who have kind of a vested interest in doing something kind of public and popular. Again, this kind of idea that, um, you know, the work that you create can be impactful and that that doesn't necessarily have to equal pragmatic. So sometimes doing a, uh, an impactful temporary project can actually help to um, create a more sustainable climate for doing, for doing um, community advantageous work and getting, getting architecture away from kind of um, self-interested development and so forth. So, oops. So just the last part project I'm gonna show is here in New York. So there's actually been kind of a, a weird um, knock on effect in the sense that our work, uh, which you know generally was, was commercial to begin with, um, similar to the earlier projects that I showed you, um, when we, um, took on more uh, nonprofit work just for our own kind of um, interest or, or because we you know, wanted to sort of um, work in this more hands-on way, uh, we actually then have been commissioned to do work um, similarly from, from private uh, clients. And this is, um, this is in downtown Brooklyn. Uh, so this was a disused um, sort of public park where they used to, I mean, it's not much of a park, it's still almost like a traffic island, but where they would kind of keep trash and, and this kind of thing. And so we sort of um, riffed on the uh, local local look of New York scaffoldings that, that you kind of find all over the place and came, we wanted to make something that was, again, this kind of um, uh, low cost, high impact look that really allowed for everybody to 
kind of find find a place in it. It it was a, a design competition with a lot of um, fancy designers who wanted to make fun sculptural objects, but our proposal really leaned into uh, a community based. Um, so this is from today. So they just put up like this second phase of it uh, this morning, which is this uh, upper level. So I'm happy. Um, but um, this this kind of platform for people to come and, and give their own um, sort of to, to inhabit a, a space themselves has really been exciting to watch. So, uh, you know, passing by, you can always see different people kind of accessing this because the design is is very welcoming and friendly and allows people to, um, you know, not be intimidated. As a lot of times, architecture is is kind of intimidating to people. They don't really understand it. They don't really know what what it is we do in school, and uh, and so coming up with kind of a low a low threshold for entry for people, uh, I think can really help to bring more people to the table, whether it's, you know, the kind of administrative um, sponsors, or the kind of people that are usually the gatekeepers for this kind of thing, or the or the kind of everyday public, um, really, how do you design for them? It's also about designing something that they can access and, and uh, have input in. Okay, that was my little talk. <laughs> Thank you, Greg. Yep. So I have a question for Moon and Greg, and then we could kind of kick back uh, to, to the audience if they have any questions, and then we could kind of talk back and forth with one another. Sure. So this should be like a open session where everyone that's in the on Zoom sitting at their computers or on their phones kind of just jump in if you want to say something or ask a question so that we could kind of all speak with one another. So we want this to kind of be like a community or like an open session, just like you saw in, in Moon and Gregory's work. So this, it should be kind of fun and interactive. Uh, that's the idea. Uh, but what I wanted to start off with was, you know, between Moon and Gregory's work, you know, have either of you ever just sat back and observed, like after your project is finished, and you know it's done. You know you dust off your pants from all the dirt, and you wipe the paint off your hands. Whatever whatever work you were helping with, have you ever sat back and observed how the community was using your design? And did you notice something that you observed you didn't expect, for good or bad, of how it was being used? Um, yeah, I'll I'll just go first. The I mean, I think with a lot of the projects I showed. Um, they they kind of take on a different life that could never be predicted. Um, you know, oftentimes uh, the the sort of knock on effects are just you know who who ends up inhabiting the project or what ends up happening with it is is really uh, you know you'll get an email or something. Um, and what's been interesting about the project here in Brooklyn is uh, for the first time, I actually do have the ability, I live fairly close by it. So I actually do have the ability to go see it almost on a daily basis if I want to. And it's, it's wonderful to actually, um, I mean, I, I think for everybody on the call, like manifesting something that you had previously designed on paper is, is a very unique feeling. And, um, but then this sort of ability to go back and see people actually enjoying the space, you know, uh, usually usually you have like an opening or something and people are there because they have to be or because there's free free wine or something. But then to actually go and see people just kind of um, inhabiting the space on a sunny day or, or whatever, it, it, either as you intended or in a completely unintentional way is, is a, quite a wonderful thing. Yeah, I mean, well, I think that's a really, really important question, I think. Um, and actually, it's uh, uh, our, our topic, too, uh, architecting community, meaning uh, it's not just the end result. It's actually ongoing thing, right? So um, as you saw, uh, some of my projects, uh, especially the second one, uh, the, the house prototype project using this earth bag, uh, after we left, I, I, I showed it to you earlier, but um, 
I think it was interesting. They were using the same same technology to build their own facilities, but in different shapes. <laughs> we we made a square house, right? And then, but they actually start making it round shape, longer shape, taller shape, shorter shape. So, well, I think what drove that? Hmm. What drove that change in like and change in floor plan? Uh, I don't know. It's it's just it's their style. I mean, the, the the way they live or the way they want to store things. I think maybe they have their own thing. But what we did is we just kind of shared this technology, and architecting architected uh, yeah. that that uh, the process, and then they just utilizing those in, to create their own um, built environment. So that's the purpose of these kind of projects. Like uh, you know, it has to be sustained and has to be continuous, right? It's not just like a one-time like result or a uh, piece of uh, project that you um, uh, deal with. And also the uh, the last project with the Maya community is actually the, uh, have, have actually have, have more impact to it. Actually, after that small projects, we're talking about tiny projects like budget of uh, like, I don't know, like $1,500, $2,000, right? That's like a flight ticket for me to go there. But we use that money to create these tiny, small projects. And then what they do is now, you know, they have some, I would say, sense of ownership. And the government actually start to um, come into the community to have a more impact. So now they have an additional classroom, believe it or not, right? So uh, we just have this tiny, uh, tiny move. And then suddenly they start to grow by themselves. And the government actually start to uh, involve a little more. So I think it's becoming more. Uh, generating a uh, larger impact. So uh, yeah, I mean, that's uh, kind of my, my uh, take um, to your question. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> I mean, I, just to extend it, like, I think, I think that's very different than the way um, sort of uh, architecture school sets up problems because it's usually like there's a design brief and you're you're trying to solve a problem or i think it's very common in schools that it's like okay uh design the opera house and then you're like oh this is this is how i this is how it shall be used and it's very obviously because you know you couldn't spend the time kind of gathering a lot of inputs you have to make your best um presumption about how a space will be used but what you find out is that you know occupants change program changes so even if you even if you do your best intention to design something for a specific use people will people will use the thing in any which way that they they find um, best or most appealing so how do you as an architect um create again the the opportunity or flexibility for people to come in and make a space um what they what they want it to be not necessarily what you what you intended mm -hmm. which um which i had the again the experience of with um a lot of some of the um projects where they're they're actually you know i think a criticism that architects get a lot is sometimes you design a structure just to be like a sculpture, right? Like um, more of a pavilion or, or whatever. But I find that actually it's it's not a bad thing because that allows somebody else to come in and find a use that you might not have ever um, planned for in, or anticipated. And that's something that, that I think we've grown to appreciate is how you can create platforms for engagement rather than a signature design object. Just to add, add on to that, I sometimes call it um, some of the stuff that we are doing a stage for action or design framework, right? So we're actually creating these framework for the people to do their own action, right? So <laughs> interesting, Greg, your, one of your projects is actually literally a stage. So that was actually interesting. I usually call these kind of projects like stage for action, design framework. Uh, we're just having those frames um, and really facilitate uh, these activities and community actions and you know their own uh, sort of 
uh, a movement and uh, life. So I think this is really uh, important that uh, architects and designers really, uh, we should really think about, you know, what, what do we, what we can do really uh, with this community, right? This, um, it's really critical. I mean, especially these days <laughs> facing such a massive urban crisis, right? Um, I, I wish uh, young students like uh, whoever was uh, here in, in this, uh, this Zoom chat, I mean, sorry, a Zoom room, I think um, something that you should all think about as a young students and architects. Yeah, it's uh, funny you mentioned that one because again, the the original request that we got was essentially people wanted like a real theater with you know like a back of house and a curtain and all these things. And the the sort of one criticism that we get is that it doesn't really work great for that specific function now because there is no kind of back of house uh, or wings of a stage but for everything else it, it gets all these different um again to the kind of point about uh johnny you made a, a kind of um you know hint at the the metaverse um but you know the the era of social media allows us to kind of keep tabs on how these projects are being used and by different sorts of people and so there's also um, kind of an interesting layer of virtual community um, that comes up with a lot of our projects because a lot of times I'm actually, you know, if I have to make a lecture like today, I might be looking through images uh, on online of, of people who have taken photos of these projects be at an event that they were at or, or created event themselves sort of used it as their own kind of backdrop or whatever and uh and that's that's very interesting and it also again exposes you to all of the different ways that everyday people want to use the space around them rather than what you alone could possibly envision or even with your small team um so that's that's been really uh, a big advantage i think even last year we had a lecture on uh, data um and moon and i participated in that together so that's that's reminding me like you know you could we could collect information off of twitter and um facebook or you know, wherever social media lies on the internet we could collect that information of what people want what people are thinking about and then we could kind of have like this own our, our virtual community to try and develop places on planet earth that that need some you know some type of intervention like moon or or gregory showed but Mike, my, my, what I'm thinking about is what we've seen this evening are temporary structures or moons are, are permanent, but um, Greg, some of your structures are temporary. Do you see any of your work, you know, becoming a little more permanent? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because even the work, the sort of first projects that I showed you that are quote unquote permanent are not permanent because in the end they're retail projects that are subject to to kind of ebbs and flows right um but i mean so long answer yes you know if it if it kind of um if it kind of called for permanence that's that's sort of what what we would opt for i think what's you know, uh, and um, one of the projects that I didn't show, we actually used some of the earth bag technique that um, Moon worked on to make benches and so forth. So um, it's a great, I wanted to say that the, the sort of act of building that brings people around the table in terms of these kind of uh, many hands processes is really wonderful in terms of the process of construction, right? So rather than sort of one, cement truck making the concrete if everybody can kind of come together and and make a piece of of the project that's that's a lot more significant um the issue i had was kind of where i sort of started off my presentation with with the permanence projects is even though the project itself is more permanent i would argue that the impact is less significant because 
again, the ability to create a, as similar to Moon, right? These are, these are self-initiated projects. They're very low budget and they are serving a, a kind of a small segment of the population. Um, and they're done through a lot of volunteer work in a very short time frame. So in terms of the priority, I personally um, always tell the participants that join us that we really, we're not there to solve a problem. We're there to kind of uh, do something that's more akin to like a firework. That is high, a high impact work of design that exposes a lot of people to a lot of the conversations that we want to have. I, I'm kind of kicking myself that I didn't show an earlier project that was kind of um, led us to this point. But, um, you know, um, John, like some of those, some of those art pieces, they're, they're happenings, they're, they're moments, right, that, that kind of existed. And either because they're captured or because they left a lasting impression, there the work takes on uh, a greater meaning, let's say, and I think that might be the case for some of these temporary works. Again, they they didn't necessarily have a client; they they were they were conceived to be, um, let's say, uh, have a wow factor, and that wow factor allows you to bring people to the table and generate discussion. And again, to Moon's uh, thing about architecting community, that's really how you begin to sort of stir the pot. And that can then say, oh, this uh, sort of, you know, this public space that we did in Brooklyn, um, that will now be a concrete area going forward. We stole some traffic and so forth. It's a dumb example, but it just goes to show that the temporary can also then beget a more permanent solution, but it's opened the door to the conversation and brought all the people around the table to sort of then naturally sort of see the advantages in the in the pop-up or in the um, temporary structure and then start to say like, well, I guess we should have a permanent theater. Where could it be? Or how could we raise the funds and, and so on? Yeah, I, I just wanna add on to that, uh, you know, even though those house prototype projects are permanent, we call it prototype, right? So it's a prototype, it can be expanded or it could be uh, multiplied. So we're actually um, using that project, that permanent project as a, again, a process. And I really like the fact that Greg, you mentioned the firework. It's like almost like a little firework happening and then it's like expanding and growing and, and start the conversation, right? Uh, you know, the initiative, we're, we're initiating these actions, right? Architects, we're not just kind of service uh, provider, but we should kind of act as a kind of initiative or activist, right? Bring the conversation. That's what we really need to do uh, to, um, you know, tackle these kind of um, uh, issues with the communities and, and stuff like that. So uh, I, I just wanted to <laughs> mention that. I wanted to invite our audience, if anyone has any comments or questions or ideas of how we can architect community or something you may have learned that you didn't know before. I just find it thrilling. So I'm not a student, right? I'm on staff, but I just find it thrilling to watch, um, you know, Moon and Gregory show examples of how just the, the idea of creativity and bringing just like even base skills to a community can ignite the community to start, you know, architecting for itself and like how it, it sort of feeds itself. I just find that whole process to be the most like exciting, wonderful, you know, you talked about firecrackers, like you, you're bringing the spark of creativity to this place and then they're taking it. And what it gives back to you obviously is you know, it goes in directions you couldn't, had not have even anticipated. And how thrilling is that? You know, because it's, then it starts to really meet a need and people take ownership. And that, when people take ownership of a community, my God, that 
is really architecting a community because then they're invested in, in making it better. Um, I would just like to say, I think it's pretty cool that you guys are a blessing that's bringing a blessing to these communities. Um, but I think that we would all, well, for me personally, I would love to know how do you start something like this? Do you have to be in a firm and then go to the government and pose it as a question? Or like, how do you rebuild a community or start to build a community? Yeah, so uh, I'll just for myself, I, I think we we kind of pride ourselves on the gorilla aspect of it, um, just to blend Susan and your comments a little. Um, you know, nothing we do requires a good amount of technical knowledge more than you guys already have. And I think that um, our, our design build program was specifically designed for architecture students out of a frustration that we experienced as young architects where we're sort of cooked, cooked in school, cooked in school. And then the opportunities when you leave are very few, far, few and far between to exercise all of this toolkit um, that you've been developing over the past five years. And what you find is that a lot of times our skill sets are, are luxury services that only companies and, and fancy clients can afford. So what you bring to the table is extremely valuable as students. Um, and obviously the more of you that get together, the more kind of pooling of talent and abilities there are. And that has, that has real value. Um, an architect is a, a luxury um, service, right? So if you parachute in, a, in an area uh, and start knocking doors and saying, you're going to give away your skills or you're going to exchange those skills, you know, I'll pitch in my architecture ability if you pitch in materials at cost and based on, we have the lumber, we have the, the design, all we need is a, an area that's not being used to, to make a stage for a local uh, or like the Shuguruban example of um, refugee housing, right? It's like, if there's a population in need or a problem that people see that is evident and you can kind of propose them a solution where they don't really have to do much, you know, they just need to say yes. It's a lot easier for you to guilt them into their cooperation <laughs> because you're coming to the table with, with this kind of um, uh, collective approach, right? All the pieces are kind of in motion and nobody wants to be the one that kind of holds it down. I mean, this process, again, is pretty by the seat of your pants. Let's say you build the plane as it's flying. Um, but that's, again, part of the idea about not having a very preconceived attitude towards design. So if, if one door closes, you can pivot and go down another quickly. I guess a simple answer is, um, I mean, for me at least, uh, the 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 way I start this kind of work is through uh, actually my grad school. Um, you know, I, I was really interested in what's happening uh, in this uh, developing countries like global south, right? I was actually experienced that, and then I really wanted to continue that, uh, continue to research and work uh, on those areas. Because I, I had a, a a bit of passion. Uh, for these um, uh, underserved communities in, in different worlds, right? So with that passion, and I was kind of knocking the door, like, like um, Greg was saying, like, so I was trying to find the opportunities. Is there some other, uh, you know, groups that dealing with these kind of issues or design companies, uh, you know, tackling those, those design challenges. So I, you know, as I was doing that, I found this NGO who's working in Kenya, which doesn't necessarily do architectural work. Moon, can uh, you can you define NGO for for the audience? Yeah, the NGO is called M3. It's a international NGO uh, located in Kenya in New York. So they do a lot of art education, 
uh, also the fashion and some other like, uh, you know, design uh, related um, education work uh, with the communities in Kenya. So I actually uh, got to know the, uh, the, the group and we start to create this architectural program. And that's how I began to work this kind of project. So I think uh, there are opportunities, uh, opportunities out there, especially these days, there start to become, uh, you know, there are lots of um, uh, opportunities and companies who are actually dealing with a lot of these uh, uh, type of projects. I mean, even the principal winner, Francis Kiri, uh, his, his work is all about community driven uh, projects. And I learned a lot from his projects. So uh, it's about you having a passion for the community, whether it's your own community or community in, in Africa, uh, you gotta have some passion for them. And also you, knock, you should knock the door and try to find these opportunities it's out there. You have to be, just be proactive and, and, and talk to me like, or, or Greg, <laughs> if you're interested really, like just email us and then say, uh, I really want to do this, do that. I really want to learn. Maybe you can start the conversation. So that's why we are here. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm actually uh, taking a group down to Costa Rica in uh, two months. So you can uh, email me if you want. Put my email in the chat. <laughs> I am putting mine too. Uh, <laughs> I have uh, one project coming up uh, in Senegal. So it's a school project. Uh, I might need some students later on, but uh, if you're interested, not only that, but also other projects that I, I shared today, we can also talk about it. So I'd my also, email, <laughs> go ahead. I'd also say that, um, you know, a lot of times, you know, we're teaching in the Manhattan campus or, or whatever, but, you know, a lot of people in school or on the call are part of local communities themselves in the areas they're from. And actually, it's a good starting point to just look in your, your local area. Um, and uh, there, you know, I'm, I'm always surprised that everybody winds up being in Manhattan kind of applying for the same jobs. When actually in your local town, your local borough, your access is a lot greater, right? So calling, calling your local alderman your local community board is a lot easier when it's not like the heart of new york city and that can allow you to have kind of a bigger um seat at the table let's say or, or it's easier to get a seat at the table um when when you're when you're younger just starting out and those can be pretty interesting jobs from an architectural point of view um kind of getting involved in in um city not city planning per se but um local planning sometimes regarding a new a new civic project that's going on or so forth so you can also understand how these systems work from the other side and that makes it a lot more um easy when you're an architect to then become become the kind of collaborator when you understand what the other side's um, priorities are or their interests are that's a very important point. I mean, we, we, we just talked about projects in different um, countries or global south, right? But then we're not just ignoring the local issues here. I mean, there are lots of lots of things going on locally for sure. Um, so, uh, and I think for me, looking at this kind of conditions in global south or Africa, I think it's giving me a kind of, um, kind of new perspective uh, same things. Um, I can definitely learn from it. And then, uh, I don't know, maybe perhaps I can utilize those, you know, local contexts like New York City or, you know, United States. So it's not like one thing. It's actually, uh, we're talking about, um, you know, the, the, the global uh, uh, and local, right? We call it local, right? So we are talking about global context. So 
uh, yeah, reach out to your local kind of community or institutions just and just be familiar with uh, what's happening out there. I think that was, that's really important um, that you mentioned, Greg. Are there any other questions from the audience? Juliana is asking, are these project opportunities typically only open to architecture students? I think the answer is no, right? The answer is no. Any, any other questions? Not a question, but I just really want to uh, say thank you for the presentation, uh, both uh, Mr. Melatonov and Mr. Moon. Uh, it was really inspiring. I'm actually doing a my thesis uh, right now um, on exploring in vernacular architecture and creating uh, a clinic for indigenous villagers in Sierra Leone. And it's, uh, especially your presentation, uh, Professor Moon was uh, really opened my eyes and I, I kind of took some photos of your work and re really for inspiration. And it's, it connects to what, what I want to continue doing with my architecture career. Let's keep in touch. <laughs> Definitely, I will send you an email soon. I would love to share more. I have a question. Uh, it's open to you guys. Uh, what was your first project and um, how was, how was the project? How did it go? That's the one I wanted to share. And then I, I cut it out because we were worried about taking up too much time. So dumb. Um, I, I, I'll verbally describe it, but it was basically like um, I was working on my first job and the job got very repetitive. And um, so uh, some friends in the architecture firm and I, um, we, we bought 500 t-shirts on Amazon and um, like printed them with a graphic of a bridge uh, because that's what we were doing as dorky architects. And we hung up the t-shirts like laundry and the, but we made a space with the laundry line. And that was done without anybody's permission or whatever. And it was a one afternoon event but what it allowed, it, it kind of brought people's attention. People were like, oh, what's going on? Why is there laundry under this bridge, you know, and so forth. And it brought a lot of people um, to us to generate conversation. And we kind of sold the t-shirts as a way to just interact. And that um, was kind of just a dumb way to blow off steam when we were young professionals, but ultimately has been like, one of the more significant sort of sort of a, what do you call it like the foundation foundations of our of our design practice because it's it's really low low intelligence <laughs> i don't mean to i don't mean to phrase it but i think especially um, for those of you who will go on to the graduate school level like things are supposed to be really really rigorous it's like it's like who can kind of out sophisticate the other in terms of like the how clever or unique in technology or all this stuff. And then you realize that doing just doing something gets the ball rolling and brings people to the table. And the act of communicating with people, like we saw in a lot of Moon's um, process photos, like the act of building and working with people who may have never done this before and how like much passion they bring to it is is sort of really way worth a lot and and that kind of makes you know this whole thing about architect and community being able to be the one who instigates and brings people around a subject is sometimes as important or valuable as the object or the thing itself so the process is kind of more important than the, the project and that was something that we didn't even realize that we were learning when we were doing it but looking back uh you know however many years ago it's pretty it's pretty clear that that was really like the thing that that started us on on this path and again completely self-initiated no permissions you know tiny 
tiny, you know, whatever, whatever you would use to spend on dinner, you spend it on a project and just go and do stuff. Don't wait for anybody to ask you to do anything. Mm -hmm. For me, that, that's interesting. Uh, for me, uh, the first project through, I'm talking about first project through this organization. Uh, that first house prototype was the first project and we had a budget. We had a, like, I'll say, um, 5,000 US dollars. I mean, that's less, I mean, just for the project, right? But then it, it, the next project, uh, the budget for the house was about 2,500 or less than that, right? And then the last project, the Maya community project is we're talking about even less than that because we had a donor, but then donors stepped out. So we had no money, obviously. But then the, the impact of the, of the project is actually uh, the other way. <laughs> The, the lowest budget project has a like a major like a major impact to the community and then the first project we're mostly focusing on you know how to create these walls and you know that kind of thing so i think it, it was interesting we had a, such a large budget at the beginning compared to other uh, but then it has a less impact but we start to learn more how to involve the community how we really engage with the community how make how to make them to be participated in this action and how we actually creating a framework for them is actually start to evolve uh, um, as, as we go to the next next projects with a lower and lower lowering budget. So I think that <laughs> budget is going down and then we're actually learning more and then we uh, take into more consideration of this, we call it architecting community is actually, um, the graph is actually going up as an impact. So, uh, I don't know, I kind of wanted to share that. Uh, that's, um... Hey, Moon, I forgot. Um, did, did you have a translator? Did they, did the people that you work with speak English? Uh, the, the Kenya, they, they were a Brit British, they were British uh, colony, right? So okay, they speak okay. English, but okay, this, okay. this community, particular community, uh, not everyone can speak English. So uh, usually community leaders and elders, they speak English. And we also had a, uh, translator uh, in our uh, NGO, so uh, who's who's a Kenyan, right? So she was actually a, a mediator or um, sort of a communicator uh, between us. So uh, that was really helpful. And Gregory, do you, and I assume you speak Spanish, yeah? Uh, I speak enough Spanish to get around, but a lot of the participants in the program don't, and that's um, that's always really. And the, the Tapachula project, um, a lot of the migrants that are in Mexico don't speak Spanish because uh, like in the news, you hear about the Central American caravans. They're actually made up a lot of, um, of uh, people from the Caribbean, Haiti, and, um, and uh, Senegal uh, who are kind of making their way across and then up. Um, so Spanish is not actually as useful sometimes as you think, but more uh, to the point that the students really, again, the the kind of working kind of across the way with the cultural exchange is like a big part of the immersion and, and the learning process. And what's great about construction, I started my um, architecture, professional architecture career in Italy. And it's actually very interesting um, when you are only able to kind of use drawings tools, basic um, construction vocabulary to kind of communicate. And it's, it's wonderful because you can actually, you know, you can build a building without really even speaking the same language as somebody if you kind of like are, are working together um, and learning about each other and so forth. So again, the process of, of how these projects come to be, um, it's, it's really hard to document, unfortunately. Um, but uh, you know, when you're on site and there's 10 languages being spoken and, uh, you know, 100 people kind of all running around doing, you know, rel re relatively um, simple tasks and kind of uh, enjoying the day is, is quite wonderful. Um, yeah, again, a lot of these projects become festive um, atmospheres where people, even, even if they don't want to do the the contribute to the construction, they'll bring snacks, play music, um, just kind of be good hosts because they realize you're doing something for the community. And again, they don't, they don't want to be the negative influence. They're 
they're they're willing participants in some form or another um and that's really it's that that's very wonderful beautiful that was a really good statement you mentioned about the drawings uh gregory i think the name for our, all of our students that are here to, to listen to it's like maybe we don't two people don't speak the same language but we could actually use our our technique of drawing and the, the standards that we have to communicate information so we don't even need to speak with each other you make really nice drawings they're very clear and it shows where a wall needs to be materials that need to be used and you just don't have to say any words so like a great drawing you shouldn't have to say anything right and you just hand it off and you could build it and i think that's another way like architects could bridge the gap and, and you know break down barriers maybe just with the way that we work models drawings I, I mean even the map project that we did together with the community right that was really exciting because um you know they see their land with some sort of drawing or graphics like you know for the first time almost right so that was quite an impact right they start to get some sort of um i would say sense of ownership <laughs> just having that map because now they know how how the land look like where they live <laughs> you know they actually create the map as well right all the mapping processes are done by those people and the community um, uh, groups so i think the graphics yes the drawings are a key uh tool to uh, make this environment and, and at the same time it's actually providing a sense of ownership so i thought that was I have a question for Moon. So, you know, you're saying like as you as you kind of um, have done these projects, you're kind of uh, mm -hmm. you're able to to economize because you you know sort of what it takes and so forth. I'm wondering um, in some of the um, community engagement charrettes, the design charrettes, have you um, sort of developed something that's approaching like a methodology mm -hmm, mm -hmm. for these where you're like, okay, first step is to run exercise one. Mm -hmm. uh, so for, for the third project, uh, we actually start to create the series of survey questions, like, you know, interviews. So we start with uh, finding out what the real community needs are. And then sort of we start to create a, develop a set of questions, right? If that makes sense. And then uh, we st start to um, generate a series of design charrettes. Like, you know, uh, we talk about this issue of a uh, new school and, you know, and, and we start to talk about, you know, maybe we can have a, uh, you know, design workshop. So it's, it's kind of informal to be honest, but then that was actually really good um, learning for us. Uh, from that point we start to maybe more we can structureize some of the uh, techniques and um you know way we, we interview or way we create these small group discussions i think can be a little bit more structured and there there's so many people out there who, who does this kind of planning work right uh, even in like you know global south even in the united states right how to begin to talk about things with the communities i mean there's so many other so many books talking about it so I'm still learning to to make this thing a little bit more legible and uh, more uh, influential, perhaps for my next project. Um, and that's why I need uh, collaborators like you <laughs> and, and people like here, uh, students, right? I really need to know or need some inputs. Uh, it's not my own project. It's actually a project for the community. So we need some uh, really like collaborators who can support each other. I have a question for you, Greg. I, I hope we, we have some time for it um, because I, I was really fascinated by fascinated by your your project, whether it's a nonprofit or profit. A, it has a, some commonality. You're still dealing with uh, how people can engage within this kind of cafe that you're creating, right? With a non, it's like a nonprofit project that you're doing. So it's like there's a really, um, you know, whether it's a nonprofit profit, it's really um, your your you have this philosophy of uh, making places for people. So I, I was really um, fascinated by seeing those works. And my, maybe my, my question is more realistic one, right? How do you really balance, uh, you know, doing this kind of project in terms of like timing, budget, you know, obviously nonprofit work is, you know, hard to do if, if you don't have enough budget and it's time consuming job. 
right? And and profit is, you know, you have a client, you need to make some deadlines. So I, I'm just curious how your practice really uh, control and balance uh, between these two type of works. Um, if that, I hope that kind of makes sense to you. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, I kind of touched on it a little bit before um, when it comes to how people end up um, over time have like kind of used the projects that we've done. So, um, you know, over the years, we're able to kind of create a feedback loop um, in terms of the projects that we've done. We can, we also put those projects out into the world through um, uh, media, right? Mm -hmm. And so you can, you also understand how people respond to your architecture either in the in the real world right like they what what are the impressions that they take away from the space because they uh they love the colorful roof so they take a post and they um, send it out into the world or uh you submit to the fancy you know design boom arc daily whatever and they choose to pick up your project and and um and feature it. So those give you kind of uh, guideposts in the dark <laughs> that you can go and sort of you start to orient to, um, again, similar to our first, uh, this dumb installation with the t-shirts that I mentioned, you, you don't really know what you're doing in the moment. Um, but uh, over time, we've kind of learned that the projects that are designed forward in the sense that they are meant to kind of be public art works um, for the people that can experience them. Uh, so the project I showed with like the cars kind of on the outside, it's really trying to take an opportunity to make like a public art statement out of a commission that doesn't necessarily call for it, you know, it's like a, a cafe or something. So we could have done something that was a little more um, sensible, certainly. But the, um, the, the kind of response that you get from creating kind of a piece of art through your architecture uh, has this feedback of creating more, um, people wanna see more, people want more from you. So with the design build projects, what we found out actually is, is the, the um, potential within the projects and the process that we are driving is almost more appealing to people than the actual result of the thing itself because there's a million kind of nicely designed uh, pavilions or things that are certainly done with more design intelligence better materials more more structural detailing and so forth but because we've always made the case that um, our design work should be should spark inspiration or at least um, allow um, I kind of call it lowest common denominator design, where there's there's a broad appeal for everyone. So uh, like this colorful thing in Brooklyn, like uh, I, I've shopped that design around to every community board um, in the city because they all, the Department of Transportation, um, Parks Department, the community board, uh, there's a, a program that just handles scaffolding all of these people had to weigh in on the design. And the only way that the design kind of came out almost exactly as how it was proposed is because the design is, is, so, is so kind of friendly and happy that nobody can kind of find something to hate. <laughs> and, um, and so that's something that we've kind of, um, that, that, that we've kind of leaned into over time and learned to trust ourselves. But again, it's also people's, again, what people respond well to. Um, and I think architecture really suffers, honestly, from that. If it's not Frank Gehry or Zaha Hadid, people don't know about it um, because there's no place for them to really in, enter, right? How, are you, how do they know what's good or something, right? What is, their, what is the criteria that we as architects put out into the world for how our work is supposed to be appreciated? And I think I think that's changing. You mentioned Kerry winning the Pritzker. I think some of those conversations are, are changing, but certainly you and I probably went to school um, at a time when it wasn't, it wasn't really about the user. It was more about the, 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 the design of the object or the intelligence of the object. Thank you. 
Um, I had a question. Go for it, Celine. I was wondering, so you guys talked about how like the, the domino effect of your projects and how it affected the community. How has the projects affected you, whether that be your design or you taking new technology in different places that you do your projects? How has that affected your, your work in a sense? And not just the community, but you as a designer and your projects. Greg, you wanna? Sure. Um, so I kind of touched on it before. Uh, like, I think the issue is that when you, when I started, I thought architecture was about solving problems, um, and and about justifying the design, like you might do in a in a review, right? With your jury, you might try to justify your your process. Um, and then that meant when I was with a client, I was, I was justifying my designs in terms of how I was solving their problems. And the audience that I was talking to was always pretty tight, right? It's like the client, me, and, and like, what's the, what's the dynamic? Since I've started the nonprofit, I've found that you have to tell a narrative to a vast variety of different audiences because you're, you're kind of explaining to a builder why he should donate his lumber. You're explaining to a government why they should allow you to um, you know, ruin their parking lot or, or whatever it is. And, and so again, as a result, like I have to be more convinced that the design is actually for other people and not all about me and my ideas. Yeah, I'll also answer shortly. Uh, I, these are my nonprofit uh, public interest design work. And I also have a practice, which I actually didn't share today, but uh, those these projects actually influencing me, uh, the, the way I see um, uh, architecture, obviously, and, and how, how I design things, right? So even my practice, um, we're dealing with a lot of, um, uh, public architecture or civic spaces. Uh, but at the end of the day, we're talking about the same thing. Uh, I'm trying to create a place for people and uh, it's actually used by people. So that's the focus. So it's almost like kind of creating a, almost uh, my, my way to see things and create things and see our profession. So, um, you know, and, uh, and it's still ongoing thing, Celine. So um, I hope it's the same thing for Greg. <laughs> Yeah, there was a good comment in the chat and I had thought about it, but somebody pointed out uh, about what is community and working working with other people, right? As architects, it's a very collaborative um, discipline. And I think that in school, it tends to be all about you when, it's, when you're at a job, it's all about your boss. And so learning to create in our practices, Moon and I, like um, a platform that actually allows everybody to come to the table and be on equal footing with us as maybe the, you know, the person who kind of generates the conversation is a lot different than the person who tells everybody what to do. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's not necessarily something that for me was, was obvious at the start, but now I, I, I have no problem letting everybody have a say at the table because I know that diversity is going to um, result in a much more um, interesting project, whether it's like the baseline common denominator or has all these different inputs that everybody's kind of added a piece like a, a big um, collage. I, I think it's going back to John's earlier presentation. We're talking about community, but community is right here, you know, your classroom. It's like if, if you don't know how to communicate with your colleagues or your, your classmates, how are you gonna do this once you go out there with other people and other larger audience, right? So I think having a community within your own boundary right now in your studio or your classroom, you know, just try to uh, practice how to communicate and really help each other, like support each other, having a comments and, uh, you know, collaborate. So I think that's really important. Studio culture. Yep. All right, it, it's eight o'clock, right, Susan? I think that's our time limit. That's pretty much it. Anyone have any final comments? Do we do we think we answered the 
the call for this for this lecture this evening. I think you exceeded the call. Yes. <laughs> All right. High five. I'm giving everyone a gold star, including 46 people who are still here on this line. Nice. So you will get applause today. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Yeah. Have Thank a you very much. It was great, Gregory. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Mate. Gregory Moon, John. This was Thank really ama an amazing presentation and discussion. Thank, Thank you, you all. Thank, Thank you, you, Alessandro. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, everybody. Thanks you for all the great Bye -bye. questions. Thank you so much.